Hi, I'm John Wilson and I'm just back from Thailand on holiday for three weeks and I'm sat behind the lovely fishery here in Lemwade with the Angling Direct crew all ready to answer some of your questions. Well it's been pretty good really because the, the average temperature where I live in Chumpong in the south of the, the country is between 30 and 40 degrees. Even our swimming pool runs at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, it's like a cup of tea. Well I made the fishery um, five years ago by enlarging an old um, lake, making it deeper, extending the banks, planting it with a, um, a variety of local shrubs and trees etc and stocking it with lots of different fish. Fish from South America, a couple of species from the southern United States and of course all the exciting Thai species. Well I certainly don't miss the weather because I've been cold all week. Um, <laughs> my knees have been cold, I must be getting older. Um, I think I miss probably more than anything, long trotting. Long trotting for Chubb on the Wensum, long trotting for Grayling in Hampshire on the, on the Tess and on the, the Avon. Yeah, I guess that's what I miss most of all. Well, I guess it really depends on circumstances because at the moment um, it could be health reasons that, that brings us back to the UK. It certainly wouldn't be the cold temperatures um, and we've also got six grandchildren that we miss and, you know, you want to see them grow up, so um, I don't know. The vote's out on that one. <laughs> well, I guess I was about, I don't know, five or six years old and um, we used to make nets out of Granny's old stockings, you know, Nora Batty's. We used to tie a knot about that far down from the hem and then put a coat hanger through the hem in a ring, whip it to one of Dad's old garden canes and we used to go down to this little brook called Hillyfields Brook in North Enfield where I live because at that point I was, I was a Londoner living in London and um, Dad's arm being longer than mine could reach under all the dark crevices which were probably about that deep and come in with stone loach and the odd frog or minnows, but most of all sticklebacks, silver ones, uh, the henfish and the males, the red throats. And, and as a five-year-old to see a, a glistening red throat in the bottom of Nan's net when you inverted it and popped it into the, the um, can was wonderful. Um, well, I guess it's a long story. I started um, with Dad's netting sticklebacks and then I um, went on to a bit of thread tied onto the garden cane and used to half hitch a worm on and we used to catch sticklebacks, minnows and newts. And, um, and then Dad bought me my first rod and we used to go and fish the, the little streams around Enfield and then further afield onto the River Lee, where I, I learned to trot for roach, um, catching them on stewed hemp seed and that type of thing. And then when I was about 14, 15, I, I went um, north to the, the River Waveney in, that borders Norfolk and Suffolk with a friend of mine. And we caught, in fact, I caught a two pound roach that first week. And we had some bream for about five or six pounds. And I liked the tranquility and I swore one day I would live there. And so it came to pass. And um, I lived in Norfolk for oh, 40 years before I moved to Thailand. Um, and it started really with doing a few radio programs and then television came along. I made some um, see-through videos for, for a, a private producer. And um, they, they got shown to Anglia Television and they liked it and then I got a 17 year TV series out of it. We made Go Fishing for 17 consecutive years, 108 programmes. And then I made programmes for Discovery for five years. Um, and one thing led to another and while all this was happening of course, 
I was writing books because a friend of mine, Christine Slater, who was a, a, a co-owner of TaylorMade Holidays, used to send me out with a group of eight or nine um, anglers to various parts of the world and that provided all the information and all the, the research for my then television programs, material for books. Um, I wrote for the um, Sunday and Daily Express for 11 years. Um, and it, it's funny, you don't say I'm going to be an angling writer or a TV director or producer, but it just happens. Um, well, in part, I suppose it's being able to put your ideas and methods across to the new generations of, of anglers coming through. Well, it's nice to think that people think I've had an impact, and I suppose I have. Um, if you want to hand something down, um, a legacy, then all the TV programmes and all the books that I've written, I hope will stand the next generations of anglers in good stead, just like my heroes, people like Dick Walker, stood me in good stead throughout the 50s and 60s. Well, out of all the programmes that I've made for television, which is over 160, I think my favourite was a Go Fishing series. Uh, and the programme that I'm thinking of was called Weirpool Magic, and it was filmed 100 yards from here at Lemwade in the Millpool. And I believe I caught two roach, one of two nine and a half and one of two ten and a half. And I couldn't duplicate that today if my life depended on it for various reasons, and I had some bream, and I had a, a pike on a little American bait casting rod, and the program was so much fun, and I caught the fish that I wanted to catch. You don't always, on television programs, catch what you set out to catch. Um, and in terms of a broad series, I, I made quite a few. I've, I've fished in over 60 countries, and I made television programs in 30 of those. And one of my favorite programs appeared in Dream Fishing, uh, and that was in, in Thailand, funnily enough, where my brother and I fished a lake called Palm Tree Lagoon that I still fish. Um, in fact, I've had some big fish out of it in the last couple of years. Up, Mekong catfish up to 350 pounds, for instance. Um, but during this program, I went and lost a, um, a big catfish of about 150, 160 pounds, because when my tray snapped, my brother's friend caught the same fish the week later and weighed it with my tray still in it. Anyway, my brother went on during that same programme to catch a 160, 170 pound arapaima uh, on float fish bread flake. And we had um, fish called paku, we had um, Siamese carp, and we had some different types of catfish. And uh, it was, it's probably the most action packed programme I've ever made. Uh, well, probably what springs to a lot of people's mind is a program I made in um, Canada with a, with a guide called Knapp. And we were trolling for big lake trout in um, Newelton Lake at the time. And I didn't know, but the Canadi Canadian government a couple of weeks beforehand, Knapp incidentally was a, a Dini Indian, and the Canadian government had taken some of their land back and he wasn't in a too happy mood. And, I was asking, what did do 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 Nat? Mm. And he'd hardly answer me. And <laughs> it came to the stage when I just didn't bother to answer, or if I spoke, I answered the question for him. And we were trolling in the late afternoon, and I hooked this really big lake trout on a big spoon, fishing 100 foot deep with a downrigger. And uh, as I'm playing it, the rod snapped, bang in two. <laughs> I thought that's all we need, isn't it? And there's another programme where I was making in Ireland for, I can't remember, Polygram, I think. And um, we were making a bream fishing video um, on Loch Ree. And um, it was going to be a programme about slider float fishing um, for these big bream, about 50 yards out. And um, the day before, 
we'd wrapped the car up. I had a, a, a 2.3 Audi Quattro, and, which was quite fast, and we'd wrapped it up around a couple of trees. Anyway, my wife, Jo, went along to, I think it was Athlone was the nearest town, to see if she could get it mended, whilst I started this filming this video. And I'm there all ready to cast the first float out of the day, and my wife arrived, got out in the car and went <coughs> So I said, okay. And the cast, the, the rod snapped, the 13 foot rod snapped off like a carrot, just above the handle. And that was the only float rod I'd bought. So I turned it into a quiver tipping for Breen program. <laughs> Um, no, it didn't really. Uh, I, it, it, was, it was fishing for tench on a local estate lake, and I can't mention the name because it's a private estate lake, but the tench fishing is very good there. And I just got these new bite alarms out, and um, they were the first bite alarms, of, bite alarms of their kind. And I'd caught quite a few tench, and I repeatedly knocked these rods off the rest. Uh, I don't know how it happened, and this was inflaming the producer, and I was getting all het up. And anyway, we made it in the end, um, but <laughs> but it, 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 I remember that it was a difficult program to make, very difficult one. Yes, I do. I I don't know why Anglia Television, who have got all the uh, old go fishing programs, some of them on on tape, some of them on. Uh, digital form. I don't know, and there's 108 of them, I don't know why they don't have me in there and f for say 20 or 30 of the programmes have talked to camera and just tell people how the programmes have evolved. Um, they'd get a lot of mileage out of that but Anglia don't seem to want to do it. I, I don't understand. I think there's so much reality stuff nowadays that, that everybody wants, you know, Love Island and Big Brother and all this. And I think people want to see that. They don't seem to want to see fishing nature programmes. I may be wrong, I hope I am, and I might get a phone call from Anglia one day, mightn't I? The, the short and long answer to that is no. I've, I've made one or two um, promotional videos for uh, Master Lime Walker in Thailand during the last year. Um, catching big arapaima and Macon catfish. Uh, but these are going to be shown on YouTube and on their website. But in terms of actually making a program again, and, and I mean, I'm 75 in three weeks, for heaven's sake. I don't know whether I could stand it all. <laughs> all right, well, my biggest sea fish is a 400 pound marlin. And my biggest freshwater fish is a, a 420 pounds freshwater stingray in Thailand. But I've also had Mekong catfish up to 350 and, and lots of sharks, but I don't think I've had any sharks bigger than 400. Um, oh, I had a 400 pound sturgeon in Canada, a nine foot sturgeon on the Fraser River. But that's all estimation. You, when you're miles from nowhere, you can't weigh a 400 pound fish and it wouldn't do the fish any good anyway. So to pray see that, in salt water it's 400 pounds and in fresh water it's 420. Um, it's a difficult one. Um, catching the two mars here in India, 81 pounds and 92 pounds in a couple of hours and having the photograph of them each was something special. But then again, I had a lot of big perch from the, the ooze in Buckinghamshire. And um, I think on three occasions, I had bags of perch, like six here, nine there, whatever. And in each case, there were three over four pounds in each catch. And um, I couldn't do that today. Yes, it was, it was on a, a boat called Tina and we were trolling for sailfish um, off Melindi in Kenya. And uh, there's two tales to this one, so bear with me. The first tale is I wanted to do an intro with a snake around my neck at the local snake farm. 
So we went to see the snake guy there and he said, yes. He said, but I'll make sure I don't feed it before you come in because it'll puke all over you. So um, we said we'd come back at the end of the shoot. So we did this shoot, we were trolling and I caught a, a bluefin tuna about, I don't know, no, a yellowfin tuna it was. It was quite pretty, about 12 pounds. And I plopped it over the side and um, to, for wait to the boat to swing round so the sun hit the fish. And at that point, because we'd stopped, both outrigger baits, which were trolling for sailfish, zoomed off. So I played two sailfish in that were complete and utter surprise. And we got the programme there and then, really. Um, and then I suddenly remembered this yellowfin that I'd plopped over the side and I heard my pen big game reel clicking away. I thought, hello, what's this? To cut a long story short, I played it for two hours. You could see the sweat running down my shirt, around my back. I played it for two hours and the skipper, Angus Paul, said it's a black marlin, probably five or six hundred pounds. And on that gear, you're not going to do anything with it, which I couldn't. And then all of a sudden, like a Polaris, it decides to come right up and just before it hit the surface, the line snapped. Anyway, to return to the same shoot, I went back to the snake farm and uh, I'd got this python round my neck and um, they didn't say anything. And I did the bit to camera, welcome to the sailfish capital of the world here at Millennium and all that. Did that and Peter Millich, one of the cameramen, said, I just want to get a still. So he went like that, and as he went like that, this snake reared up and nearly bit him. We're talking about a, a 10 foot python that thick, right? So I thought, get it off my neck, you know. And um, it transpires that, um, and I took a shot of them, that the keeper and his friend, they could give me the wrong snake, and they used to irritate this snake into lunging and biting them, and just missing his nose. So, <laughs> Things we do for TV. Well, I'd have to ask God to bring all the roach back to the Wensum, and then it would be winter, long trotting after, a, once the river's been in flood and it's fining down and there's a certain color between green and brown that's about that much visibility. And I'd be long trotting with a centre pin reel to catch big roach. That's an enormous question and I could sit here until next week to answer it uh, in 20 years. Well, it all 20 years ago. Yeah, it all started in the 80s with too many cormorants flying over from Europe uh, and them slowly eating all the roach and the dace and scarring the chub. And um, I should have seen the signs early on, but I didn't. I, I'd be early morning kneeling down in a, in a roach run, free lining for bread flake, and all of a sudden a cormorant would get up and fly away. And I thought nothing of it. But of course, the upper Wensum being generally a smaller river, um, a shoal of big roach in one swim might only be 11 or 15 fish. And the cormorants used to come every day or every other day until they'd clean that swim out. That's one area it's changed in. Um, and of course it's changed because people then stopped fishing for roach. Um, the carp became the most common fish in Britain and the most fish full. That's been a complete reversal. When I was a kid in London, um, to try and catch a carp, they were like gold dust. There was one park pond I used to poach and catch a few carp, but it was difficult. Uh, whereas roach were everywhere. So I think the, the trans, transition from the British Isles becoming a carp fishery uh, or carp orientated, put it how you like, to roach is the biggest thing that's happened. I and mean, you go into a tanker shop now and it's, it all looks like 90% uh, carp fishing gear. And it probably is, but what's the point in, 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 in trotting for roach and selling trotting rods uh, for fish that aren't there? I feel very sad about what's happened and of course in recent years, uh, in the last 10, 12 years, we've had to suffer the otter. Well sadly, there's only one answer and it derives from our forefathers. 
Um, our forefathers used to hunt otters and hunt foxes because they were a nuisance. They were a nuisance then and they're a nuisance now. Uh, and unless we start re-hunting otters, um, the freshwater fishing in Britain is going to get harder and harder. I hate fishing in fenced in environments. Fishing is getting out into the wild. Uh, uh, and having so many otters infiltrate our fisheries has made people fence fisheries in and this has caused um, animals like deer, foxes even, um, cock pheasants and I used to watch out of my bedroom window every morning 15 years ago pass by the lake can't even get there anymore because everywhere's fenced in it's created such an unnatural uh, situation that uh, I fear for how fishing's going. Well, I think um, looking positively at it, if you live in an area that, that, that um, the fishing isn't very good, you can always drive to Hampshire or drive to Scotland or go to Northern Ireland or whatever, or fish the big tidal rivers that don't seem to get predated upon by otters so much because of their flow and depth and holiday makers on the broads, for instance, you can still catch good bags of roach on the, the lower rivers because there's too many people about. Well, I suppose somebody else might say I have the latest rods and the latest bag of boilies and the flavours and this, that and the other, but I would say learn to base your fishing on natural history. Learn to walk quietly, wear fairly drab clothes, um, make very slow movements. Don't go like that, because if you point at a fish, you'll, it'll see it and you'll scare it. It's not the colours so much on the bank, it's movement. And cr all creatures, whether it's a deer, browsing on grass or whether it's a fish, um, it's bankside movement that, that is going to scare them. Um, people often say to me, why is it you pick your legs up like a chicken when I'm walking along? Well, watch a chicken trying to grab a worm. It goes, then puts it down, lifts it up and puts it down. It doesn't go, because otherwise the worm would go down the hole again. And I remember watching that because I used to go around my granddad's who had a rag and bone business and I used to feed um, his chickens worms that my dad had dug up. I used to watch him, you know, walking like this and ever so quietly and I would, I would teach kids to walk quietly, always wear Polaroid glasses, a peaked cap because otherwise you've got to do that. If you, if you go like that with a peaked cap, what it does, it cuts out all the superficial stuff that you don't really want to see. I don't want to see the top of that tree and this cloud and that cloud. I'm, I'm concentrating on where the fish are. If you like a television screen on the lake or in the water. Uh, and of course a peak cap does that for you without you putting your hand up. All little things like that. I think um, it's a case of being at one with natural history. Um, for instance, if you can identify the trees that are, beside the river for instance on the Wensum here if, if you've got some willows now willows have got very fibrous red roots that stick out in the under the water come out from the bank that the roach and dace and other fish spawn on but mostly the roots provide protection under the protect under the protection of the roots you might have a um, an undercut bank into which fish will move you can often go along a, a river like the Wensum with Polaroid glasses and see absolutely nothing in the swim and it's because they're under the bank because they probably heard you walking along in the first place but anyway so I would base my as I still do in my own fishing in Thailand where I live now I base it on, on, on a, a love and a knowledge of natural history and by doing that I think you become a better and a more whole angler Yes, I'd wish I'd caught a three pound roach trotting. I know I can go to carp lakes and stand a good chance of catching a three pound roach, but um, my biggest is two fourteen and a half, an ounce and a half short. And I just wanted to catch it trotting because of the, the skill involved in trotting a, a float 30, 40 yards downstream, striking and then playing it back on a size 16 hook and hoping a pike doesn't grab it when it gets into the margins. All that is, is, has got so much more skill 
and it's so more demanding than just picking up a, a rod in which the, the spool's already re rotating and the hook's already in the fish that you want. It's just a personal thing. I'm not saying bolt rig ledgering for roach is wrong, it's not. It's a way of catching them and it's a very effective way of catching them. And I do use bolt rigs on, on certain, I caught my biggest barbel just over here on a bolt rig. Well, I've been answering your questions for some time to the best of my ability. Um, let me ask you one. If you were me, how would you like to see fishing now? Um, would you like to be long trotting for roach if they were back in the rivers, if we had, for instance, a national cormorant cull that I think they should have been? Um, would you like to, to see less anglers in not fenced in fisheries where you can just ramble with a bag and a, and a bait and a rod and a net and just creep here and creep there and not really, I mean for a lot of the fishing that I do I don't even use a stool, I just kneel down. Um, what would you like to see?